especially as Catholics, we need to have a relationship with the Spirit that's just as um, present and prevalent in our lives as we do with the Father and the Son. Because it's the Spirit now that makes the Father and the Son present within us, right? Paul tells us we become temples of the Holy Spirit. Like It's a deep reality to try to grasp, and so we have to wrestle with it daily. Yeah. This idea that my body is actually a dwelling of the Holy Spirit. To the magic of video production. <laughs> Bam, boom, we're back. <laughs> we're back. Gianni, we thanks got for played. coming back on. You got played? Yeah. How so? <laughs> I like what you guys did here. You guys. You go, we're going to wear a blue shirt and a red shirt. So I bring both and then I don't you even come own up a red and. Shirt, dude. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for Sunday for actual Pentecost since we're talking about Pentecost? Oh, I'm in the broadcast booth. Nobody sees me anyway. That's a lame <laughs> excuse. It works. Lame. They do have SJE merch, uh, Father Declan said, with the red shirt. So that is true. Um, if you want, well, check out our SJE merch store. You guys can pick out a bunch of stuff. Yes, a lot of cool gear. So Pentecost, here we are. So we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit today. Amen. Um, there is a Come Holy Spirit shirt on the merch store. We have Vene Sancti Spiritus, Come Holy Spirit. Nice, love it. I like. Did you guys coordinate this with no, the stripes? Did not. No, we were singing at a barbershop. Barbershop quartet. Yeah, where's the rest of the here? quartet? Yeah. <laughs> no. Speaking of happy days on the last episode, you guys are like, yeah, we're on it. it back. Yeah. Hey, it's. Uh, I want like a malt right now. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Oberweiss? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have fun. It's all right. Yeah, we do have fun. So, why do we wear red for Pentecost? So, you mentioned that. Was that a thing? Fire. Yeah. Fire. Holy Spirit, I assume. That was pretty easy. Yeah. All right, episode's done. So, <laughs> Yeah, right. All the blood. So Pentecost, we're how many days away from Easter? 50. 50. 50 days. Is there any significance there? Why are we um, celebrating Pentecost? Why is it 50 days after Easter? I know Bobby knows this. I know. I was waiting. I, I feel like I always jump in. Well, we talked a little bit about two podcasts ago about Jubilee. So the Jubilee is seven times seven is 49. That's the perfect number. Jubilee year, Jubilee days. But it goes back to the Old Testament. Pentecost was the Feast of Weeks. It was originally set up as a feast for the harvest, as in the springtime, and for the planting and stuff like that. So it also had to do with the 50 days of that the Jews received the law. Mm. And it's a really cool uh, fact. I don't know if I talked about this before but I've, I've constantly go back to this is that on Pentecost, when Peter is preaching, he says, repent and be baptized. And 3000 people were added to the church. But if you go back to the original Pentecost in Exodus 32, when Moses comes down and they're worshiping the golden calf, the Levites step up and they slaughter 3000. So this was a fulfilling and a reversal of 3000 dying in the first Pentecost and 3,000 being born being born again to life in the new Pentecost. It's not by accident. Again. It's like the, the Bible is so ingenious. There's over 66,000 hyperlinks in text going back and forth and more than others, obviously. But that Pentecost is, it's the Feast of Weeks. It's the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, but it's the coming of the law, the coming of the new law. There's so many parallels. It's so awesome. I love I, how deep Bobby gets on his answers because... I would have just told you that Pentecost is literally Greek for 50th. Oh, well, 50th well, what is it originally called Pentecost? Yeah. It was originally called the Feast of Weeks. I forgot what mm -hmm. the Hebrew is, but... I was going to say Lent. And it's 50 days from the second day of Passover. Yeah. Lent six weeks. So Easter has to be one extra week, seven, because why would we fast more than we feast as good Catholics? That's, that's what I was going to say. But yeah, that's a good I, I think, who was I with? Uh, oh, my mother-in-law was in town. <clears throat> and she was talking about how when she comes here, her diet goes out the window. So, what are you feeding her? Yeah. We're feasting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can't. Well, you can still feast so that, healthily. That, that was my, healthy. You can't have a healthy feast. Sure That's you can. It defeats the purpose. Yeah. This, this is coming from you. Meditarian. It's like you can't fast while the bridegroom's here. I'm not going to fast while my mother-in-law's in town. She cooks too good. <clears throat> yeah. So we're going to feast. But uh, so we, we feast. I like that more than we fast. We're celebrating Pentecost, coming of the Holy Spirit. Is there an so for for I think most Catholics know Holy Spirit identified with a dove, 
Mm. Yeah. How do you have a relationship with a bird? Oh. Are you just showing off the bicep there? The dove right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Double buys. <laughs> no, I, that's, I got the dove tattooed. So how do you have a relationship with a bird? Ooh, I can kind of, well. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to make I was going to say, <laughs> I know in the Jonine corpus, so in the Gospel of John, the idea of the paraclete is representative of a physical like r manifestation of Christ post ascension. Mm -hmm. so, Not a parakeet, paraclete. but a paraclete. Yeah. We've got to confer, confuse Plete. with the birds Plete. there. Right. So paraclete. it's a different kind of bird, I think. Yeah, no, yeah. it's not. Um, uh, so kind of, I've never really liked the dove. I mean, dove knows ark. Like the dove coming down at the baptism. Yeah. Dove coming down at the baptism, yeah. right? Signs of peace, olive branch and stuff. Um, but especially like in John's gospel, it's so clear this idea, I know chapter 14 is just rife with the peace that the spirit brings. And G once Jesus leaves, he says to his, you know, apostles, I, you know, I'll leave and I'll send, my father will send the paraclete to be with you, to teach you and bring to remembrance all those things, which I've taught you before. Um, so I don't know if we have to have a relationship with a dove Bird. per se, right? Well, I love, and we were talking on the last episode about icons. I love how God himself uses icons. The mm -hmm. Holy Spirit is not a dove. It's not a bird. But God uses the imagery of bird to point to a deeper reality, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit among us. Specifically, in the, when Jesus kicks off his ministry, when he gets baptized by John, the Father is so proud that he, the, the, the heaven breaks open. This is my son, right? And so after Jesus ascends, we see another image. It's not a dove, but it's a fire right, that descends on, on the apostles. And so God's own use of, of images, icons, is so rich in Scripture. So when you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you're, you don't necessarily have a relationship with a dove. Mm -hmm. When you see doves in church, they point us to a deeper reality, and that's the Holy Spirit is with us today, not just guiding us as individuals, but he guides the whole church. Remember the talk you guys gave last week, was it on about Lexio Divino at the Be Fed? I love that scripture passage, I think it was the gospel for the day, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, yeah. where Jesus says, it's better for you if I leave because then the spirit will come yeah. in your, in your midst. Yeah, and I liked, he says, I'm going to give you another advocate, not to say that he's not going to be an advocate anymore because wherever the spirit is, there's Jesus. It's like wherever one of them are, all three are there. And that's mm -hmm. what we forget too. But I think I think it's not so theologically correct, but I heard Father Mulata talk about it too. But have you guys ever read the book, The Shack, or seen the movie? Mm -hmm. So they do a good job of, like, because it's, there's breaks down, like the dove image breaks down. All these images break down. So in the movie, it does a good job of, like, trying to show God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as three separate persons. And how different they are. And like this guy, he needs like a, a so the, God the Father appears to him as like a, a grandmother. And the Holy Spirit is kind of like this spiritual, it's a person, but it's somebody who's like really fluid and like all these colors. And it's just, and then Jesus is like Jesus walking on water. He's like a carpenter. So that's, that one's pretty easy. Like we get that from the gospels. The other two, we have to use metaphors or, you know, it's like God isn't, God the Father isn't like on a cloud and with a great beard and things like that. So it's really hard. Same with the Holy Spirit. It's like we imagine uh, tongues of fire or fire or a dove or these different images. So it's hard for us. But sometimes it helps to have a visual like a movie or something to try to get you to try to understand like how they're different because they're they're different, but they're the same. But they have three different, you know, they have diversity, but they have unity at the same time. It's like they all have different roles. And it's just, it's, 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 it's awesome to see, and we can get into, you know, the, the whole spirit who it ascends from and, and the whole, uh, the orthodox argument. But, but I think sometimes visual aids do help. I know for like myself, when I, after I seen the passion of the Christ, did I have a hard time for every time I thought about Jesus, seeing Jim Caviezel as Jesus? Yes. Yeah. But it helps help me to visualize like the actual suffering or like watching the chosen it helps you enter in more deeply. Not that those people are the thing, but it helps your imagination to enter deeper into the mystery mm -hmm. by having some kind of visual aid. That's what visual aids are for. They're there to help us understand better. Not necessarily the visual aid is the representation of yeah. what it is. Well, I mean, Jesus himself knew that. That's why he gave us sacraments. Yeah. Right, one of the, the basic definitions of a, what a sacrament is, it's a visible sign 
of an invisible reality. And so we have body and blood, bread and wine that turn into body and blood. That's a visible sign of the invisible reality that is we are consuming Jesus himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity. You have baptism. It's a visible sign, this pouring of water and the saying of these words, I baptize you in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Visible sign of the invisible reality that you have just been born anew into the body of Christ. <clears throat> so sacraments operate in that way. And then to a lesser degree, our sacramentals, lowercase s, and our images operate in that way. They're visible signs, the dove, the fire, the whatever it is, of invisible realities, those immaterial things that we might have a hard time grasping. I mean, that, that happens in science. Like I, I, you know, I was watching a video by, by uh, uh, Feynman, a uh, physicist. Richard Feynman. Yeah. Richard Feynman. And he was talking about atoms and how hard it is for us to conceptualize atoms when we talk about, you know, things on that level, the atomic level. And because the scale is so small, it would be like comparing an apple to the size of the earth. I mean, just the comparison. And so sometimes it's hard for us to vision or numbers, right? The, the galaxy, when we talk about God created the, the universe. Well, I mean, the scale of the universe, I mean, the fact that light can spin, spin the sun seven and a half times in a set, it's just, it boggles the mind, Or right? It takes eight minutes for light to come from the sun to the earth. I mean, these scales are so large. How do you conceptualize them in the spiritual life? It's no different. Right? I'm not comparing science to, to the spiritual life, but there are, there are ties that can be made. So we need these symbols to help us understand them more deeply. And Johnny, it's okay to yawn, buddy. Are you struggling <laughs> to hold it in? Getting up early. Yeah, Get, poor kid's eyes are watering. <laughs> getting up early for mass. That's for mass, what happened. Yeah. Is there an image of the Holy Spirit that you guys, like, how do you relate to the Holy Spirit? What role does it play in your life? I mean, everything. I mean, for me, once I surrender to the Holy Spirit, as far as I know, we pray a lot here at St. John. We always start with come Holy Spirit. I have the kids doing that. It's that for me, it was the, everything that changed. Like when I had, you know, when we're baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit. When we're confirmed, it's sealed. But I like the analogy that Matthew Kelly, I think was the first one I heard it say it, is that when we get these graces, it's like chocolate milk. It's this milk and you're squirting chocolate into the, into the milk. You can keep squirting chocolate into the milk, but if you don't take the spoon and stir it up, it's just like milk with like some clumps of chocolate at the mm -hmm. bottom. Um, it's also our response to those graces that we receive. And if we don't stir them in to, to use, if we don't activate those graces that we already have, we don't cooperate with them then what good is it? It's just a bunch of clumpy stuff at the bottom or it's just uh, getting the, the, the gifts and putting it in your closet and never opening them up. So once I started to step out of my comfort zone, then you leave room for the comforter to come in. And that's by trying and doing different things that the spirit prompting you to do. Spirit's usually prompting you to do things that you shouldn't do, telling you, say, hey, you probably shouldn't say that, you shouldn't do that, or you should do that. Like, what are you waiting? It's like, if we just you know rely on our own, natural abilities, our own talents, or what we want to do. It's like we never leave room for the Holy Spirit. So once I start opening my life up to being uncomfortable, to to listen to the voice of God, like, what are you calling me to do? What should I do, Lord? What, you know, I have to ground myself in that. That's really helped me change my relationship with the Holy Spirit because it's tough. It's like the, the Spirit is calling you to do things that you wouldn't want to do normally. Like, hey, you should really pray for that other person. You should go see how they're doing. And like, you know, you, it usually involves, you know, time consuming things or something uncomfortable or something that, you know, you're putting off that you're not doing or something, you know, you should stop doing. It's those things that are challenging us to grow and to change. Mm. Does that experience resonate with you or do you have um, a different? I think I'm a little different. Yeah. I think, uh, two facets. One, I really enjoy that. Um, Augustinian notion, the spirit is the love between father and son. Um, because I think when you start to meditate or contemplate on, on love, especially in like the spiritual reality, um, it embodies a lot more than maybe what we, how we use it secularly. So, it, I mean, it really can take on a full, a full person as we call a Holy Spirit, like a person of God. Um, the other thing <laughs> It's like the teach. I really like Holy Spirit as like the teacher 
or the counselor. And so, I mean, similar to kind of what you're saying, helping to lead decisions in life, but not so much um, in these particular things, but especially when I'm praying, I have a hard time differentiating between like contemplating, like resting in these, in the beauty of these, of these deep things. And then um, making it a logic puzzle and trying to figure out yeah. all the connections. So sometimes just surrendering it up and seeing these beautiful things come out of prayer, these great conclusions or great revelation, whatever you want to call them. Um, I like seeing the Holy Spirit kind of very present in that aspect, I guess. Yeah. I like the image too of, you know, the advocate is an advocate is somebody on, like on your side, like, like pleading to God for you or to Isn't it people. funny that Jesus shares the Holy Spirit to us in legalistic terms? Yes. Mm -hmm. Cause that's where else do you hear the term advocate come up yeah. think, other than in, in kind of a courtroom setting? Per, um, paracletus. I think, I think that's, um, where that paracletus, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, is side para means side, right? Is, uh, typically was used to talk about Jewish defense witnesses. So in the Jewish court system, they didn't have um, necessarily like a defense attorney. Who they needed at least one witness. If some, you have to have at least one person to, to testify to your, to your story or, yeah. you know, they couldn't, it couldn't just be your word. You had to have somebody. It couldn't be a woman. It had to be somebody who was like upstanding in the community. But, and, I th and I think that's so interesting because then, um, when we talk about the gospel, I don't have to convince you of the gospel. I just have to deliver the message. It's like the Holy Spirit's right there on my side That's doing point. the witnessing. Like you say, like witnessing to the, the fact that what I'm speaking is, is true. So, I mean, to your point, like the legalistic terms, it's very interesting, mm -hmm. especially like that, yeah, that side witness almost. And the <laughs> juxtaposition between the images we have of the Spirit, where it's almost like, um, I'm trying to come up with a different word, then uh, that we've softened or um, the word that's coming to mind is like uh, effeminized the Holy Spirit in this gentle like dove type of, but when you actually look at what's said of him, it's more of this, again, legalistic, like uh, someone who takes your defense, who pleads your case, who's by your side, who assists and who helps and who guides. So it's a very strong reality. And uh, I, sometimes the the dove metaphor falls a little short. So that gospel, you like the fire. I love the fire image because I mean, fire. Yeah, it could burn down, but fire could also heal. Mm. Right? You burn down the land so you can reap better crop. You heat up, right? So you can cook. Like the fire image is just such a strong image, right? It's a burning image. Yeah. Burns away that which is not good within me. That's what the Holy Spirit can do. The fire of the Spirit. Can burn away those edges and those those traits, those 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 habits that that keep me from Christ and aligning my will to God's will. And so, yeah, I love the fire image. Yeah. Christ says he wishes it was already ablaze. Mm -hmm. Like how much he wishes, but fire can burn, it can heal, it can heat. There's that, that and what's the other image that it can be multiple things is the wind. He's the breath of God. It's the wind. You know, mm -hmm. wind can move sails, but it can blow down your house. It can, you know, these, these images, same with water. Water is the other thing with, we associate with, with, with the Holy Spirit is in baptism. Water, you can drown in water or you can be washed clean. You can be, you know, you need to drink it. It's the water of life. It's like all these images, there's a, like a, there's a, there's a good and a bad to them. Just like us. It's like things that we do. You have like, it all depends on the mode of the receiver. It's like the sun can, can take, uh, like wax and soften it, or if your heart's really hard, it can uh, it can hard that, that example you use it with the Pharaoh mm -hmm. when he talks about his you know it's hardening his heart. It's like God's love can make you harden your heart, or it can melt your heart depending on how you respond to that to that spirit. And that's that's the thing. It's just like it it's you know it has a lot to do with the mode of your heart on all the things, whether that's receiving the sacraments, you know, this Thomas Aquinas talks about the, the mode of the receiver is how it's going to be received. If you go into it disbelieving, then it ain't going to have much effect. The grace is still there, but you have to cooperate with it. So you don't want to mess with the Holy Spirit and get burned. That way. And I kick the conversation off a little tongue in cheek with you can't have a relationship with a dove. Yeah. I a lot of people can have, it's, 
<laughs> I wasn't expecting that. It was a little creep for us. Uh, you could have a relationship with the father because that makes sense. Like we we know what it means to have a relationship with the father, a relationship with Jesus because he was a person. Yeah. And you, we have the accounts of scripture and he walked among us. And uh, I, as especially as Catholics, we need to have a relationship with the spirit that's just as um, present and prevalent in our lives as we do with the Father and the Son, because it's the Spirit now that makes the Father and the Son present within us, right? Paul tells us we become temples of the Holy Spirit. Like It's a deep reality to try to grasp, and so we have to wrestle with it daily, yeah. this idea that my body is actually a dwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's no longer an ark right? that was carried around yeah. by the people of God. No, it's God residing within me. And so this idea of having that relationship is so important, but it again, it's it's a hard one to try to, to to just understand off the bat. So, have you ever had like they call like a baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you know what the difference is? Have you had one of those overwhelming experiences? How would you define that? What what? Well, what do you ask? Well, that's like there, there's times all throughout Acts where the, this is I think it was the like Acts twelve or something like that, like where we are baptized, we have that, but there's like a baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's like it's like a serious encounter in your life. It's like sure. when you've been so overwhelmed. I don't know too many people who are confirmed and all of a sudden like, woo, I'm on fire for Jesus. Like maybe it happens from time to time, but most people see it as a Christian graduation versus I'm sealed in the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna go set the world on fire. Have you had one of those like moments in your life? I mean, you obviously are hearing, discerning the call to become a priest. So there had to been some kind of thing in your life or was it more gradual? Or, you know, you, you're giving your life to working for the church, not because you want it, you're in it for the money, because there's not a whole lot there, I'm sure. But that something happened as far as uh, what they call like a baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is just like an overwhelming encounter of the Holy Spirit that you can't really explain. Like there was a, a point, something changed. Like this, there was a physical manifestation of something, and I was different after it. Yeah, I guess I, I never had a, like I can point you back to this is the moment at all. It's most cradle Catholics, right? Yeah. Um, but I know my year at Purdue before I entered the seminary, there's like this very slow, gradual change of my heart that one day I kind of, um, I, I've never been one. I've got a great memory, but I've never been one for being able to tell you I was sitting in this spot and it was this day in this hat. Like, I just can't do that. I just don't care about each individual day that much. Sure. I, like, you know, doesn't hold up memory in your yeah, brain. Now I'm the same like, okay, way. whatever. Um, but March 25th, I'm pretty sure was the day of 2022. I was sitting at the seminary after I did my, my visit. Um, and it was, it was like five 45 in the morning and I'm sitting in this chair in one of the lounges and father, Chris Stanish, who's, um, who's now Vicar General, was vocation veteran, kind of walked up behind me and said, so what do you think? Um, I said, well, Father, I think I need to go to seminary. And right after I finished that last word, I was like, you got to be kidding me. That I've been fighting this thing for a year. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember saying, like, in October, the you know, year prior, I said, I, I will never do that. That is got to be the stupidest thing anybody can do. So... I, I use an example and obviously like a lot has been clarified since then. So I don't want to make it sound like that moment has put me on this trajectory with like absolute certainty. Like, again, it's not that big, but um, there's a very gradual change in my heart that I mm. like, and I ha wasn't aware of. So I think sometimes um, the spirit, like, is kind of cunning maybe in the sense where he's working in me in a way that I didn't even, mm. I didn't even notice. It's like, and at this point I'm going to mass every day. I'm praying in front of the blessed sacrament every day. Praying that, like I'm, I'm doing a life of prayer and reflection because I'm trying to figure out what the heck do you want me to do with my life? God, what do you want me to do? But I was so oblivious to this one portion of my heart that he was kind of striking at. And, and working in, um, so I guess that's, that's kind of that's normal for most most 
cradle Catholics haven't had in like an encounter. <clears throat> it's huge. A, a huge and that's moment. okay. And that's okay. Yes, it doesn't yeah, make you any okay. less. <clears throat> what about you? What's the, uh, well, you, I know you had a, like a reversion. Yeah. Did you have like one of those experiences? Well, what I like about Gianni's perspective, if I could just comment on that and then I'll share mine. When you do the things that you ought to do as a believer on your road to becoming a disciple, then that's, that is God and the Holy Spirit forming you and gradually equipping you to go on mission. Mm -hmm. And mission doesn't have to be, it's not like I'm going to pick up and go to Asia. Like that's not, I'm not going to go to, like that's not what mission is. Mission is being rooted in the vision that God has for your life. And in, in the way that God wants you to live his mm -hmm. love in the world, in living his love, you become an expression mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes that happens gradually. For me, the moment that comes to mind, at least as, as I'm thinking about it, you're asking the question, it wasn't, the one that stands out wasn't like an overwhelming feeling of the Spirit. It was an overwhelming feeling of the absence of the Spirit that got me. And it was, you know, I'm living in the world. I've got friends and we're doing the things that, you know, you do, you party, you drink, you, you know, you dabble with this and that and the other thing. And it's like, because you're trying to to, to fill this God-sized hole in your heart, you, sometimes you don't even recognize. I didn't recognize that it was a God-sized hole in my heart. And the more I tried to fill it, the emptier I felt. And one one evening, I just, like, I literally collapsed to the floor in tears because I tried everything that was accessible to me, and I still felt empty, like in a way that words can't really express. And in looking back at it, that was God pulling the Holy, that was the Holy Spirit pulling back and allowing me to taste this like absence, this hopelessness. Like a prodigal son. Type. And in so tasting it, you want it more. And that was my conversion point. I was like the that was the one that I can turn to and say like, no, all this stuff is empty. Like that's why I want to share Jesus with people because if you don't have Jesus, you don't have God and you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, whatever you try to do to fill this, this longing within you, this restlessness that we all have, it's going to lead to nothing. Yeah. Eventually, if you keep on that road, you're going to keep hitting dead end after dead end. And it's, at that point, if you're honest with yourself, you, you have to turn to God. You have to turn to Jesus. And it's in him that you find fulfillment. And so that was it for me. It was like the pulling back of the spirit and tasting the hopelessness of this world without God. God letting you feel what you chose. And just wanting more of him. Yeah. I, I guess why I'm obsessed kind of thinking about it, because as a convert, I had a couple of these experiences where I was overwhelmed with my initial conversion, which I didn't know was the Holy Spirit, but I was just overwhelmed because I had the same kind of thing, but I was at mass and I was open to, to it and I just became overwhelmed with love and peace. And then that fades, obviously, that you, we can't stay on the mountaintop. And then for like another year, year and a half, then we went to the amazing parish conference and I'd never been to adoration before. I didn't even know what the conference was for. I thought it was like for a marriage thing. Our parish priest didn't really explain it very well to us. Mm -hmm. And then we show up to adoration and Matt Mars there. And it was crazy because I was struggling at the time. I was smoking weed and doing all this other stuff. And when I got invited to the conference, it was on 420. And it literally, they just legalized weed in, in Colorado. And I got asked to go here. I'm like, God, okay, this is a first sign. It's like, he's entering, go, go, you know, this is my, my cross. I, I need to go after this thing is, so we go there. And then my confession was great. It was like, I had two confessions that were like these crazy experiences. This was one of them. There's like a hundred priests doing confession in a big room. And the guy like kind of looked like, he like almost transformed to Jesus. It was so profound in my life. And then I went in front of adoration and I cried for like an hour straight. I was just like overwhelmed with tears and joy, like being surrounded with other Catholics who were on fire for the Lord because I didn't experience community in that way. I had an individual uh, individual experience of the Holy Spirit, but I never experienced it as a community. And when I first felt that, and plus in front of the Blessed Sacrament, plus Matt Marr playing a concert in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and everyone's on their knees, everyone's praising the Word. I was like so overwhelmed that after that moment, I'm like, I'm going to take my faith serious. I'm like, I didn't even know what a disciple was, but I want to be that. And I want to help make other people because I went through the world. I, I've tried to fill that God-sized hole in my heart with other things that 
just made me miserable. So I wanted to, to share like, hey, this is how it used to be. This is now how I am. And I can only explain it by one way. It's the Holy Spirit. I, I didn't know any better. I didn't know anything. I was just open. And that's a lot of times what it takes is just to be open. Just, you know, that's why we like Alpha so much here at the parish. And we used to lead it beforehand is that through the process of being in community with other people, praying with other people and talking out these issues and these things that you may not quite understand by the time you get to the halfway point of the Holy Spirit weekend away is that a lot of these people you got to become close with, but mostly is you're letting your guard down where you can trust and be open to the Holy Spirit and to having an environment and a place where you can let the Spirit in. Because too much, we let our guard up because we're scared of what like, he's going to call us to do, which is change everything. Like, Go sell everything and, you know, follow me or change, you know, stop doing these things and do these things. It's, it can be scary, but God doesn't want to take away the good stuff. He just wants to, to uh, you know, amplify those and, and wants you to get rid of the things that are keeping you from him. So that's what I think. And if you haven't had that experience, it doesn't mean you're lesser than, but it definitely throughout the acts of the apostles, there's definitely a couple of different ways that they talk about the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Obviously, sometimes, sometimes it's people speaking in tongues. Some people are, you know, filled with joy and love and certainty, going to their death, singing psalms. Like how else could people do that? I mean, naturally your body would be recoiling about it, but there has to be something else within them that witness the people that they can be going to their death and still sing when most people would be urinating on themselves. And, and, and you know, honestly, I mean, yeah. if you've ever been in an experience where it's scary, you, you know what kind of person you are when stuff like happens. It has to be something extraordinary to do that. The, the thing I pray for people and I pray for myself is you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit aligns you to the, the Christian life. Yeah. What does that mean? It makes Jesus present in you. And he comes bearing gifts. So Jesus doesn't come empty-handed. He comes by the power of the Holy Spirit, takes residence in you, in your heart, in your mind, in your body. And he brings gifts with him. And so what I would encourage people to do is, like, discern what it is those gifts are that Jesus has chosen to give me. And gifts aren't just for ourselves. Yes, they're for us to find our way to heaven, but they're also for others. They're meant to be shared. Right? We turn to the parable of the talents, right? Yeah. What do you do with it? Do you bury it in the ground or then do you make it multiply? And so that's what I pray for myself and for others. It's like, understand the presence of the spirit in you. What gifts has he given you? And they're enumerated in the scriptures. Like we know what those gifts are. And so like pray with that, find a spiritual director, find a friend who's mature in the faith, right? Who can help you discern what those gifts are. And then how could I use those gifts? So that's one. The other thing is what I love about the spirit is he surprises us. Again, we talked in a previous episode, like if you see scripture as the end all be all of what God is, then you're placing God in a box. Well, what the spirit does is it surprises us with God, with who God actually is, right? It, it lets us see scripture in a new way. It lets us see tradition in a new way. It lets us see our practices and our pieties in a new way. When you go to mass with the spirit, you enter into mass differently. Like to this idea of being surprised by God is just such an awesome, like, Lord, how are you going to surprise me today? Yeah. How are you going to love me today? How am I going to love other people by your power today? And that's just an exciting way to, to, experience life. And, and yeah. it doesn't mean like life's just, just all rainbows and sunshine. Life's still hard. That's why we need the spirit. That's why we need the advocate, the paraclete. That's why we need somebody on our side. But it just transforms your ability to engage life in the way that Christ would want you to engage. Yeah. And that only happens when you have a relationship with the spirit. And so one practical way, like how do you develop this relationship with the spirit? Pray for him to come. And so you might hear us do this a lot on the podcast. We do this a lot in the parish. We teach people how to do this. When you start your prayer, start it with come Holy Spirit, an invitation. And it's, I mean, just that alone could be a whole episode that we do. The idea that we can call on God and he responds, that we can expect God and he answers. So call on the Holy Spirit, invite him into your heart, because when the Holy Spirit comes, he brings Jesus. And so that's one way to start kind of this devotion to the spirit, what would you recommend maybe as another way to start devotion or kind of grow your relationship with the Holy Spirit? This is going to sound kind of like, 
I guess maybe out of left field, but I think, um, I love a lot out of left field ideas. I think, I think doing very like pointed exercises in your prayer and not for a long time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, really pointed exercises surrounded around, um, the healing that you need in your life and how the spirit, right. As, as, consoler, one who comforts, counselor, one who teaches, as advocate, one who stands, like all these, these many arrays of the, that the Holy Spirit kind of embodies. Um, just like really, when you ask the Spirit to heal you and in our, in our woundedness and our, in our broken, I mean, we all, you don't want to admit it, but everybody has like these very deep, serious wounds that affect the way you live your life. Even if you don't think you do. Asking for like such an intimate, I, like riffing off you, come Holy Spirit, but asking him to come in an intimate spot, I think helps us to open up to God in a, in a vulnerable way that a lot of us, if we don't ask for it, we'll never encounter in yeah, our lives. If, you know? I, if I can build off of that, because the, the image that I love is, the reason Jesus got flogged and he allowed all these wounds to afflict his body is because those wounds heal. Mm -hmm. We have wounds in our own heart. We have wounds in our mind with the, just life can scar us. Mm -hmm. And God wants to be there to heal us, but he'll only go there if we invite him and if we allow him to meet us there. And so I would, because again, I, I've shared, I'm a, more of a visual person. I'll actually visualize those scars, those wounds, whatever it is that's, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was a negative experience, whether it was maybe somebody said something that, that hurt or I did something that was wrong or literally by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus wants to take you by the hand and go to that wound and unpack it with you and to start applying that, that healing salve that only his grace can bring. And so many times we want to just, we want to avoid those places because it hurts. We just want to do the superficial parts of it. Yeah, like we want the, to stay not superficial. The deep, not the deep part of what's no. the root of it. Yeah. But it hurts to go there. It hurts to pick out a but scab. But you can't go there by yourself. No. That's, no. That, that's what the, the the world wants you to you know talk to a doctor to go there. But when you go to those places where the scars are at, those deepest parts of your heart, if you don't go with the spirit, you're opening up all kinds of potentially damaging things that are going to make it worse if you don't have the healer, the counselor with Isn't you. that a great point, Bobby? Like the world wants us to do mindfulness exercises and go see your therapist and take this pill and it's going to make you feel better. It's like, okay, that's, again, if we're going to give the benefit of the doubt, those are good things to do. Yeah. But that's why you have something like the sacrament of confession yeah. where you have to speak those wounds. You have to speak those sins. You have to get them out. But and it doesn't have, end there. That's the problem. They don't have anything. Like we get actual grace of confession to exactly. help us. Exactly. From true the, remedies the, given when the priest yeah. encounters yes. you in the person of Jesus, gives you absolution. Yeah. And if it's a great confessor and if it's a great confession, he'll actually talk you through why you're wounded, yeah. and he'll give you yeah. a remedy to try like, to go help do you this to go to the yeah. to, to the to the root of it because. Everything's like a symptom. It's like it's like just you know, like some hurts. Like I just to keep taking aspirin, just taking aspirin to keep aspirin. But we're not getting to what's actually causing the pain where it's coming from. And if we go deep and we don't have Jesus there, it just from my experience, it just gets it can get worse. It's like the, then it can spread. Then you start just ruminating on it. Then you start thinking about uh, like you become more anxious, more depressed. But we're, we're so blessed. And isn't that a recipe just to close in on yourself? Yeah, that's what where Augustine God says, wants us is. to open up. Yeah, yeah, sin is that, curving is uh, cur uh, curving in on yourself. That's what sin is. Mm -hmm. Is that if we're so focused on us, that that's exactly what sin is. It's it's grasping. It's like only focused, hyper focused on myself. It's like now, no, I've been I've been forgiven. Now I need to. That's just like anything. Anything you're trying to to quit, like you're trying to quit drinking or gambling. No one ever just stops something. It always has to be re replaced with something better. Like that's the only way. Like no addiction programs work. None of these things work. They 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 use God. Hey, to stop doing this, but they have to replace it with something else, like meetings or you know. The only thing that actually worked, for, at least for me, was. Jesus, I mean, you can, you know, temporarily quit, but people always fall back. You have to 
replace it. You got to have the story of hell. If I stay on this path, I'm going to end up in hell and this is what it's going to look like. But you have to have a vision also at the same time of heaven, what that looks like, where there, you have a tension between, I don't want to end up here and I'm going here. It's like, you want to, you don't want to keep Satan in front of you where he's like blocking you. You want him almost behind you, poking at you, but you have your eyes fixed this way. It's like you, it's, it's like a balance back and forth. But if you don't have the positive vision of it, it ain't going to help. And that's what confession does. It gives us that positive vision. Now go sin no more. And this, you know, try this, pray this and go there and do this. You know, it's like, it's helping you practically. And then plus obviously the graces that we get, but mm -hmm. that's the healing that comes from it. You know, and that's what I think where a lot of people too, that you were hitting on it is the, 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 f the gifts of the Holy Spirit that praying I, with those. I've got to, I've got to get going. Okay. You guys want to wrap yeah. together? I'll yeah. just step out. No, you guys no, get no, going? no, we, we can stop. That's fine. We always talk uh, super long. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. That's maybe fine. we'll do a part two on the because we, we do. No, you have very you have very important things going on versus us jiving about the Holy Spirit, which is always important, but yeah. not as important as uh, the new dad to be. Things coming. God willing. Another. So maybe I'll close us up in a prayer. Yeah. And then we'll continue conversation on the Holy Spirit because there's filioque. There's, there's, there's a so million many things. Yeah, there's the fruits so of the Spirit, aspects. the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep it going. But just pray everyone has an awesome Pentecost. Amen. And that the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes. And between now and then, I'll have to buy something red. Ah, let's go. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I uh, give you thanks for this day. Thank you, Lord, that we can call upon your name and expect that you'll show up. Lord God, I pray that you pour out your Spirit on us. Pour out your Spirit on those who are listening, who are watching no matter the time or the place, Lord. Lord Jesus, soften our hearts and our minds. Let us receive you. You are welcome here, Lord. I ask that you bless us, that you draw us close to you, that we may become a blessing to others, that we may be able to share the Spirit through our, our lives, our very actions, our words, our deeds, that we may be transfigured into images of your Son. Jesus, bless our day. And it is in your spirit that we offer this prayer. It's in the name of your Son that we seal it. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Take care. God bless.